Well, good morning and welcome back. It is so good to be with each and every one of you as we take this journey through Paul's letter to the church in Rome. This journey through this letter to the church in Rome, like we talked about last week, can sometimes be smooth and easy, and other times there can be challenges. This letter really has both aspects to it. And it's a marvelous letter. It's a marvelous letter that really points us to God and points us to our need for him. Throughout this letter, we've seen that there are aspects and challenges in that we face because of our depravity, because of the fact that we are sinners in need of a gracious God, and yet we can find great joy in knowing that God extends us his grace and his mercy. And last week, we spent time beginning in Romans chapter 9, looking at how Paul was using this section of scripture to address the question of if the lack of Jews who were following Jesus meant that God's word had failed. And so we started on this journey through chapters 9 through 11, which really go together as one section. And Paul showed his deep care and concern for his Jewish brothers and sisters. And in those verses, he encouraged the church in Rome that God's word had not failed just because people who were Israelites were not following Jesus Christ. And Paul chose to look at uh, the lives of Jacob and at God giving Pharaoh over to the hardening of of his heart. And so today we're going to finish our time in Romans chapter 9 by looking at verses 19 through 33. So let's open our Bibles together and examine these verses, taking a closer look at what God's word says. So if you would open your Bibles to Romans chapter 9, we're going to be reading verses 19 through 33. And this is what Paul says. He says, You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? What, what, will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? To make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in this very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring... We would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith? But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching the law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling. And a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Paul really is taking us on this journey through chapters 9 through 11. And remember last week we talked about how these chapters are not necessarily focused just a pinpoint on God's judgment with regard to predestination. But rather it's showing us the way of God with respect to man. These chapters are used to harmonize the way of the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New Testament, who is the same God. You'll hear people try to distinguish the two and say, well, I I like the God of the New Testament, but I don't really like the God of the Old Testament. Forgetting or ignoring the fact that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, that his character never changes. And so Paul is showing that God is faithful to his word. And that he is extending his mercy to both the Jew and the Gentile. Paul's written these statements in the beginning of Romans 8 that talk about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Sorry, in the beginning of Romans 9. 
And he knows that that's going to raise a response within the people. And so Paul anticipates these oppositions that will come about, and thus he jumps into getting ahead of those oppositions that he knew the Romans would have. And that's why we see Paul address this section to the questions that they would have. In verse 19, he says, You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? You see, Paul knows that as he's talking about how God would have mercy on whom he wills and harden whomever he will, that the response of his audience would be, well, then who can be held accountable? Like, why does God still find fault if he's the one who dictated how we would live? If he's the one who dictated who would be saved and who wouldn't be, and we can't resist his will, then why are any of us held responsible and accountable? That's the question that Paul knew would kind of be raising up in their minds. And so Paul not only wants to address this, but he wants to first and foremost remind us of who it is that we are talking about. That we're talking about the God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all, the all-powerful, all-knowing God. And so Paul says, who are you? Who are you to question God? Who are you to think that you deserve to be able to critique God and his ways? To think that it's within our rights to question God. And then Paul moves on to use this example out of the Old Testament of pottery and of being molded and questioning why the creator made it that way. He even flips the picture in verse 21, asking if the potter has right over the clay to make what he wants. Does the potter have a freedom to create something for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Isn't that the right of the creator? And these themes of pottery that Paul is leaning upon come out of the Old Testament. They're themes that we see found in Isaiah and in Jeremiah where it speaks of the potter creating. In fact, in Jeremiah 18, 5 through 6, there's a similar tone. It says, O house of Israel... Can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And you see, Paul knew his Old Testament well. Paul had worked to memorize the Old Testament, to be able to teach it, and to be able to know what it said. So it's not a stretch to think that as Paul talks about the potter and the clay here in Romans, that he's drawing upon what he knew of Isaiah and Jeremiah. But this passage in Jeremiah is not making a point of the fact that God shows mercy or, or hardens a heart by an inscrutable decree, but rather it's showing that when God declares judgment, but then people repent, God relents from that judgment. One commentary I was reading said, in other words, the potter God has built into the system his saving plan. A judgment that is reversible if people, the pots, will respond to his self-disclosure, consider their ways, and turn to him. God has a perfect right to show mercy or to harden under such gracious terms. And so Paul's trying to get at this idea of if we're to approach God, we must first and foremost understand our place in relation to him. To him who alone is holy. And Paul's response makes me think of another person who sought to question God's ways, who sought to go before God and to question the ways in which God acted. Job, in the Old Testament, God had allowed Satan to have his way with Job because Job was honorable. Job was righteous and Job walked with the Lord. And Satan said, well, surely it's just because you've blessed Job. Surely it's because you've given him lots of wealth and possessions, and family, and status. And so God said, well, do with him what you will short of killing him. And Job will still follow me. And so Job loses his wealth. He loses his property. He loses his kids. Eventually his health comes under attack as well. If someone could have had a right to question God, it would have been Job. Job who had been righteous, 
who had not denied God and who had sought to follow God. And even when his friends and his wife said, just curse God and die, Job refuses to engage with that line of thought. But Job does eventually decide that it's within his right to question God and his ways. And we see how God responds in Job chapter 38 through 39. God essentially comes back to Job and says, who are you to question the Lord God Almighty? Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Did you shut the seas and did you command the mornings each and every day? And God goes on for these brilliant, beautiful two chapters of Job. Give example after example of who he is and who Job is in relation to God. Job gets the message. And we see in chapter 40, verse 4 through 5, Job finally is given a chance to respond after questioning God and after hearing God question who Job is. And Job responds this way. He says, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer. Twice, but I will proceed no further. See, Job thought he had a right to question God. Job thought because of his righteousness, because of his works, because of his following after God and believing and trusting him, that this gave him the right to question the creator of the universe. But now he knows better and realizes his place is not to criticize God who is sovereign over all. And this is the same idea that Paul is suggesting to those in Rome as well when he says, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Now, it's not that Paul is saying we can never come to God with our questions. That used to be one of my favorite things to teach youth when I did youth ministry was that God welcomes our questions. And he does. Look throughout scripture at all the people who walked closely with God, and they all tend to come to God with questions. And God welcomes them. Because there are questions out of a desire to know God, out of a desire to learn God's ways, to follow God. And those questions are welcomed. But what Paul's talking about here is a judgment and critical attitude towards God. One that says that I know better than God as to how you should render your judgments, how you should extend your mercy. That I know better than God that you should save the Jewish people but not the Gentiles. That you should save the people who were chosen, whether they follow you, Jesus, or not, just because they're Israelites. That's the kind of judgmental attitude that Paul's getting at when he says, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? It's not that they're coming with questions seeking to understand God, but he knows that the attitude that would be rising up would be one that doesn't show reverence and respect to a holy God but seeks to place ourselves in a position above God, saying, we know better. And that is what is not welcome. Paul continues in verse 22 through 24 to elaborate on how God uses his creation and how this is within his rights as a sovereign God. He says in verse 22, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Notice what Paul says here about what God does. He says that God has endured with much patience. Think back to Paul's example of Pharaoh, how he talked about Pharaoh's heart being hardened, but God didn't harden Pharaoh's heart at first. First, it was Pharaoh choosing to reject God's opportunity. As Moses and Aaron came before Pharaoh and said, turn to God, release his people, and Pharaoh rejected that and said no. And time and time again, Pharaoh rejects God sending Moses until eventually God gives him over to his hardened heart, which equals a death for Pharaoh. God endured Pharaoh with much patience. He didn't just right away at the first instance harden Pharaoh's heart or damn Pharaoh right away, but eventually God does give him over to his destruction. Notice the text doesn't tell us that God created people evil in order to destroy them. No, the text tells us that God actually endured with patience those who are pursuing evil and headed for destruction. 
People are pursuing themselves, their own ways, and their own destruction ultimately as they turn their back on God. Theologian Charles Hodge said, It is God as moral governor, not God as creator who is brought into view. It is nowhere suggested that God has a right to create sinful beings in order to punish them, but rather that he has a right to deal with sinful beings according to his good pleasure, either to pardon or to punish them. Paul here is emphasizing who God is in light of his creation and how God has a right to deal with humanity as he sees fit. And yet, as he does that, God does it by enduring with much patience those vessels of wrath. But we see the beauty of God's character shine forth in verse 23, which tells us, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Not only is God making known the riches of his glory, but notice how it relates to these vessels of mercy. He is the one who has prepared them. It doesn't tell us that God prepared those for wrath. It says he endured those vessels of wrath, but those vessels of mercy, he's prepared beforehand for his glory. Paul here is showing us that while God is the author of our salvation, we are the authors of our condemnation. As we continue to pursue our own ways, rejecting God's ways, choosing my desires and my ways above God's word, he will eventually give me over to those desires. He will eventually allow me to pursue that evil continually. And Paul circles back in verse 24 to how this relates to the nation of Israel, saying, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Paul wants to show that God has not only called the Jews. He has not only selected the Jews to be his people But as he sends Jesus, he sends Jesus to the entire world, to the Gentiles as well, that they too have an opportunity to believe, that they too are given that grace that God extends to be able to place their faith in Jesus Christ, to be able to turn from vessels of wrath to vessels for glory, for mercy that God has prepared beforehand. Paul moves forward in the remainder of this chapter to quote multiple sections of scripture from the Old Testament. Look with me at verse 25 and see how he does this. He says, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would be like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Paul wants to support what he's saying with the scriptures of the Old Testament. He wants to show that relation between the Old Testament God and the God that he's talking about today who's extending his grace and mercy to both the Jews and the Gentiles, showing that they are the same God. And so he quotes Hosea chapter 2, verse 23, in order to show the mercy of God, that God would take those who were not considered his people and show them mercy. And in Hosea, If you're not familiar with it, God told the prophet Hosea to name one of his children Loami, meaning not my people. But God also promised, though, that his judgment towards his people would not last forever, but that one day Israel would be restored and again called sons of the living God. You see, even when God brought his judgment upon the people of Israel for their turning from God, from their pursuing their own desires and their own ways, God always provided a way back. He always provided a way for repentance and restoration. And ultimately, he provides that for us in Jesus Christ, that one day Israel would have the chance to be restored and again be called sons of the living God. In referencing this, Paul is spotlighting the ways in which God is merciful and faithful to his word. He then moves on to quote another Old Testament prophet in Isaiah and shows that while God covenanted with Israel, the number of Israelites are numerous, only a remnant 
will be saved. Well, at times it may appear that there were a high number of visible Israelites. At some future time, Isaiah informs Israel that only a remnant will be saved. And we see this as this is one of the questions Paul is wrestling with, right? Is why, if God promised to the Jews that they were his people and that he would save them, why are only a handful following Jesus? Why are they all not saved at this point? And it's that remnant that's placed their faith in Jesus. That group that said, Jesus, we see him as the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. And so Paul is using the scriptures to show God's mercy as sustainer of all, leaving offspring to further the Israelites. And Paul knows that the outpouring of the gospel that he's witnessing, his desire to move broader with sharing the gospel as Paul wants to go to Spain is not a betrayal of God's word. It's not that God's word has failed, but in fact, it's a fulfillment of God's word. That God would sustain a remnant, but that God would also open up the doors for the Gentiles to come and be grafted in as well. So this leaves the question of how the Romans should respond. If they're not to respond with critiques and prideful questionings, then how should they respond? And so Paul wraps up the chapter in verses 30 through 33 He says, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith? But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling. And a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Paul raises this question of what then shall we say? Should we say that the Gentiles who weren't trying to live by the law, who weren't pursuing righteousness by the law, that they could really be saved? And that's that aspect of this chapter that's talking not just about individuals, but also about the nation of Israel versus Gentiles and how can God save the Gentiles in addition to the Israelites. That's that aspect we talked about where there is a piece of individualisticness in this chapter that we see, but there's also the bigger picture of who God is extending his grace to and how it's within God's right to save those who are outside of Israel. But Paul knows that his Jewish audience, who made up part of the church in Rome, would be saying, well, how can they be saved? They weren't pursuing the law. They weren't pursuing righteousness. Could it really be true that those who were far from the law, who never even lived under the law, could be saved by not upholding it? And then he contrasts this in verse 31 with the Israelites who pursued the law who had God's commandments and who sought to live by God's commandments, hoping that this law that would lead them to righteousness, but they failed again and again. Paul isn't saying here that no Old Testament saints were saved, but rather he's saying that too many were focused on the rules and rituals that were designed to lead them to God, not to serve as a substitute for God. You see, you can get so caught up in following the law that you miss that the law is meant to point us to God. And that happened far too often with Israel. They were far too concerned with the letter of the law. And we see that in the Pharisees as well as Jesus criticizes them for how they're living. They've lost touch with the relational peace of the Lord God Almighty. And they're missing that God has sent Jesus, his son, to save them because they're so focused on the letter of the law. And we can do the same thing today. You see it in churches as well, where churches get so caught up with the signs and wonders, with seeing the miraculous, with seeing God show himself in the miraculous or in signs. These are not bad things in of themselves, and I believe that God uses signs and wonders and still heals people and works in the miraculous. But we can get too focused on the miraculous that we begin to worship those signs and wonders as opposed to worshiping the one who gives us the signs and wonders. And I've seen people do that. They get so focused on seeing the manifestation of God and miracles in the church. They're so focused on God will heal and we just have to pray harder and we just have to believe harder. And they they begin to worship the signs and wonders and lose sight of the one who has given those 
the one who made those possible. That's kind of what Israel did with the law as well. And so Paul tells us in verse 32 that they fell short of the righteousness because they pursued it through the law rather than through faith. They thought that they could stack up their good deeds following the law and that would lead to righteousness. And yet it's never enough. We never can obtain righteousness by our good deeds, by our following the rules and and doing what is right because we'll always fall short. It doesn't matter how hard we work we don't have faith in Jesus Christ, it won't be enough. Because we can't save ourselves. We can't do enough good deeds to warrant God's grace. It comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. And this disconnect that was within Israel is why we see Paul say that they've stumbled over the stumbling stone. Paul here quotes Isaiah 28 in verse 33 speaks of the Lord laying a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense in Zion. The prophet is giving the word of the Lord and is speaking of Jesus, the Savior of Israel, who would come. That those in Israel, many would be blind to see Jesus as the Savior. And instead of recognizing who he was, they would consider him an offense. They would stumble over him and over his lordship. And we see that occur as we read the Gospels and as we read about how offensive many Jewish leaders felt that Jesus was, as he did things like healed on the Sabbath, they were concerned and offended by his action rather than recognizing his lordship over the Sabbath. And they continually got angry with how Jesus lived out his humanity as fully God and fully human. And they didn't believe that he was the Savior And Paul contrasts that with those who believed in him and tells us that those who believe in him, believe in Jesus Christ, that they will not be put to shame. Paul's words here at the end of chapter 9 begin to lead us in a shift into how we approach salvation. He's built up this role of God's sovereignty in our salvation, of his predestination and of his choosing people, both Jew and Gentile, and how that's within God's right as sovereign God. And we talked about that last week, how there's some aspects that are hard to wrestle with in chapter 9, but how in chapter 10, we'll see how Paul also says there's an individual responsibility to turn to God. How those go hand in hand, and how sometimes we can't fully understand how that works, but we see both elements here in chapters 9 through 11. And so this aspect at the end of chapter 9, Paul's moving to showing that response is necessary. And he hints at it here at the end of chapter 9 by saying that you have to believe in him. He says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Paul has been clear in our text today of God's place as the one and only true God and our place as his created beings. The question becomes, how do we live this out in our lives in a way that is faithful to the text today? I believe that it starts first and foremost with having a reverence towards God. We've often, I feel like in this day and age, lost that idea of a reverence towards God. We've become so casual in how we approach God and how we come before God, and and it hasn't always been that way. The church used to be a place of great reverence towards God and great respect towards who God was. I was thinking about Isaiah, who Paul quoted multiple times in this chapter, the Old Testament prophet, who experienced an awe and a fear when he came before God's throne in a vision. And he showed the necessary reverence that one should have towards God. He tells us in chapter 6 that he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne and that his robe filled the entire temple. And if you've never read Isaiah chapter 6, I encourage you to go and to read it because you can't read Isaiah chapter 6 and not walk away with an increased reverence for who God is and how we should respond to God. Isaiah goes on to describe angelic voices that declare God's holiness and majesty, shaking the foundations of the house. Isaiah reacts to this moment, and this is what he says. He says, woe is me. For I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips.
You see, when Isaiah is faced with the holy God, he recognizes just how unclean he is. He proclaims his brokenness, his sin and fear, and an angel takes a burning coal from the altar, touches Isaiah's lips and says, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt has taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Isaiah's response shows a fear of the Lord. He knows that the one he is in the midst of is holy, mighty, powerful God. It isn't just another king that has some power, has been given human power, but God is the creator of the universe. And true worship respect, or reflects on our brokenness in comparison to his completeness. Now, I think when we think about fear of God, we sometimes wrestle with what that really means and how do we have a fear of God? Like, do we just kind of, ah, like God's there and I'm over here? And, and how do we engage with him when we're to fear him? I think there's three types of fear I was reading about this week. There's a holy fear, there's a healthy fear, and there's a harmful fear in our lives. And the holy fear is that fear of the Lord. It doesn't mean necessarily to be afraid of the Lord, but to be in awe of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is an awesome reverence and altogether respect for the greatness, goodness, and glorious nature of God. A healthy fear would be the fear of doing something that may be dangerous or life-threatening. A young child who learns to avoid playing too close to the road or not to jump out of a tree too high. These types of fear don't hinder us, but they help us by setting up safeguards in our lives. And then there's a harmful fear. And Paul speaks about this kind of fear to his understudy, Timothy, when he writes, God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Timothy was struggling with fears that were hindering him from what God had called him to do. He was fighting against fears that if he did not overcome them, would potentially undermine his ministry for the Lord. But the fear that should trump all fears is our reverence and awe of the Lord. And this fear accomplishes two things within us. It brings a longing to be near to the Lord and a love for what is dear to him. Is when, when the fear of the Lord is greater than my fear of failure or inadequacy or rejection or inferiority that God is then able to mold me and make me into the man or woman that he desires me to be and to work through my life to accomplish what would have been impossible for me to do on my own. Proverbs 9.10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we must have a reverence toward God if we are to follow what Paul is telling us today, if we are to approach God and understand who he is and who we are in relation to him, it begins with reverence. The second way in which we can put this text into practice in our life goes hand in hand with having reverence for the Lord and is to embrace humility and to acknowledge God's mercy. The story is told of the famous inventor Samuel Morse, who was once asked if he had ever encountered situations when he didn't know what to do. And Morse responded, more than once. And whenever I could not see my way clearly, I knelt down and prayed to God for light and understanding. Morse received many honors for his invention of the telegraph, but felt undeserving. He said, I have made a valuable application of electricity, not because I was superior to other men, but solely because God, who meant it for mankind, must reveal it to someone, and he was pleased to reveal it to me. See, we must strive to have this type of humility that Samuel Morse had in his life. Recognizing that all that we are and all that we have comes from God. That God, in his mercy, doesn't give us the punishment that we deserve. You see, we as sinners deserve death. And Paul spoke to that earlier in Romans. Yet God gives us life, what we don't deserve. And in his grace, he gives us the gift that we don't deserve in heaven. This should cause us not only to have a reverence for God, but to embrace humility to recognize our position in relation to God, a holy, just, powerful God, and to worship him. To seek to live out our days humbly pointing to God as the one who sustains us, as the one who gives us life, and ultimately as the one who saves us. And the last application for our text today is that we would 
not only have reverence for God and seek to live with humility, but that we would continually seek him in faith. A few years back, there was a popular activity. I don't know if it's still popular, but it's called geocaching. And what you would do is you would look and find these spots that someone had hid these geocaches. They were like, it was like a treasure hunt for adults, kind of. So you'd get GPS coordinates, and this is when GPS was kind of becoming more and more popular. Now we have that on our phones, and we can do this on our phones. But you'd stick in the coordinates to your GPS, and you would go and follow the directions to that spot, and you'd try to find the geocache. And often they were like small film canisters, and maybe it'd be hidden in like the trunk of a tree, or maybe it'd be under some rocks in a rock pile. And, and you'd find these geocaches, and they were different size, and they contained different things in them. Some of them had prizes you could take. Some of them had uh, logs that you could write your name down in them. And so Amy and I, this was before we had kids, and we were on a really tight budget, and so we had a $5 date that we would do. And the person had to come up with a date we could do that would not cost more than $5. Now you couldn't even go buy a coffee, much less do anything else. But we went geocaching one time, and we had a GPS from our car, because we didn't have it on our phone at that time. And so we're walking around with this car GPS, and we had put in the coordinates. And we were following the coordinates to find the geocache. And it would tell us to walk this way, and we'd have to follow it that way. And, and it would tell us to go up this hill, and so we'd have to go up that hill until eventually it led us to where the treasure was hidden. And if we didn't trust the GPS, and we just went off on our own way trying to find it and thought, well, we'll find it surely, we would never have found it. We would never have found the prize on our own. We needed the GPS to lead us. But we had to believe that the GPS would get us where we were trying to go to, that it knew the best way and that it would guide us to the end goal. In a similar manner, we must continually seek God and his word, allowing him to guide us along the path of our life and trust that his way is the way. God will not lead us astray, He will guide us only towards his righteousness and ultimately towards an eternal security in him. But we have to have faith in him. It doesn't work if we don't trust him, if we don't place our faith in him, or if we don't believe that he is good in character. In this whole conversation about about God electing or preordaining, part of what underwrites all this is the fact that God's character is good and God is a God of justice. And we can trust that God seeks to fulfill that in all that he does. And so God will act with justice. And God will act with love because that is who God is at the core of who he is. And we know that from his word. We know that from lives following after God. I hope you know that from your life following after God and seeing his goodness and faithfulness. And so we must have faith. We must seek him continually in faith and trust his goodness even when it doesn't make sense to us. Even when his word doesn't make sense to us or goes against what culture is promoting this day and age or says, well, that's outdated and antiquated and you can't follow that. But that's when we say, no, but I still have faith in God. I have faith that God's word is true yesterday, today, and that God's word will be true forever. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so we must place our faith in Jesus. We must continually place our faith in Jesus, just like you would in a GPS leading you along the way. The only difference is a GPS can fail, it can run out of batteries, it can at times even mislead you, but God never will. And his word never will lead you astray. So place your faith in him. Seek to live with humility, pursuing his mercy, and know that God will carry you along the way. As we wrap up today, let me encourage you to extend the same grace and mercy to others that you've received from God. In doing so, you can reflect the character of God to those around you and encourage them to enter into a relationship with him. May our lives be a testament to the transformative power of God's sovereign grace. And may we find peace and purpose in his unfathomable wisdom. So as we leave here today, let us carry with us the confidence that though we may not always understand the reasons behind God's decision, we can always trust in his goodness, 
and his commitment to our ultimate well-being. And let us walk forward with faith, embracing the divine mystery of his ways and living out the grace that has been so freely given to each one of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Paul's faithfulness to write it. Lord, we thank you for giving us understanding and clarity. Lord, may you continue to open our eyes to your ways. When we don't understand what your word means, may you give us wisdom. And Lord, help us to humble ourselves before you. You, a holy God, who allows us to come into your presence, to bring our burdens and our joys before you. Not only do you allow us in your presence, but you welcome us into your presence. You want us to come before you in prayer, to commune with you. What a privilege that is. So may we not take it lightly, but may you grow us in our reverence for you, God. May our lives reflect the work of you within us. And ultimately, Lord, may our faith grow deeper in you each and every day. We praise you and we thank you for this time together today. And we thank you for your word. May you sustain us until we're together again. In Jesus' holy name, amen.